Father, at the bottom of our hearts, we thank you for dying on that cross for us. Help us realize other people and how they're hurting and how they're, they may have never heard Jesus before. And I pray, Father, that as Christians, that we walk as we should walk, walk in the light. Because light is what defeats darkness. And Jesus, you loved us so much that you died for us, each and every one of us. Put your name in that place. He died for Roy. He died for whatever your name is today. Put your name there because he died for you. And he doesn't want you to perish. Or even your friends or your, your parents or your brothers and sisters, your neighbors, your co-workers. Father, give us that strength to be bold with the word of God. And I thank you for this service today, Father. I thank you that Pastor has uh, come and has things prepared for us to hear and just to grow in the word of God, Father. And I say this in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you. If you would please stand and turn in your hymnals to page 786. Uh, while you're getting there, uh, we have a birthday, couple birthdays. Um, this is a man who is a very good harmonica player, hasn't played in quite some time, but Mr. Danny Thomas, uh, Danny Thomas's birthday, and a newer person to our church. She's been around for a little while, uh, but she's trying to bring her family, and uh, just pray for her and her family, Mrs. Brittany Bartholomew. Uh, let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Danny and Brittany. <laughs> happy birthday to you. All right. So if you will stand on and, and page 786, page 786, we'll sing all four verses. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed
guess I forgot a birthday. Uh, Mr. Jerry Miller, he can't stand right now. He just had surgery. Um, so let's sing happy birthday to Jerry as well. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jerry. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Uh, all right, the next song is going to be How Deep the Father's Love for Us. It'll be on the screen behind us. Uh, we've sang this before. On the first. How deep. very much at this time. Children are dismissed to junior church. Good morning. Great to see Louise back. Louise, uh, we saved some cold weather for you. It was nice here, though, right, guys? We had some yeah. nice days, but Louise came back from Tennessee. Next week we're going to Tonight, we're doing six, six weeks. I hope you're right, Denise. <laughs> yes. No. By, uh, we've had a pretty good winter. Um, pray for Mrs. Warren. That was sad to hear that about. Um, she, um, how old is um, Ann? Uh, Sharon, you know, in the early, like mid 80s, 89. 89. 89. 
okay, yeah, her birthday was two weeks ago, and they saw that um, she had had some jaundice look about her, and, and then they took her in and they discovered she had a mass on her liver, and they're not going to do anything because it's spread. Um, so pray for Anne, uh, 89. She's just a godly woman, isn't she? I mean, she just is a, a stalwart. I'm seeing, is Brandon back there? I'm hearing a reverb up here. Um, but uh, she's just a stalwart in the scripture and the word of God. And just such a blessing. But pray for her uh, concerning that. We're going to be in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. But before we get there, we'll be in Matthew 6 for a minute. But uh, you want me to wait a minute, Brandon, before I. Can you guys hear it okay? Yeah. It's just a little reverby. So. Okay. Um, but if you want to turn to Matthew 6 as we get ready, uh, let's go ahead and bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, I just thank you for bringing Louise back from Tennessee. Father, I thank you for. Travel mercies, Father, and I'll also be with our precious uh, Anna, Anna Jane Warren. Lord, I just pray, the Father, that you would uh, um, give her the peace of God that passes all understanding. Lord, she's been a blessing to us. She hasn't been able to come to church much, but she knows how much she means to us. And um, and I just pray that, Father, you would gird her up with your plenteous blessings and just give her... Give her um, if it be thy will, grant her more than what the doctor said as far as her time with us. And uh, be with uh, Estella Brown, Lord, with this MRSA infection. Watch over her. It seems like one thing after another. Watch over her. Thank you for bringing Jerry back from surgery. Being John, be with John Elliott as he cover, recovers from his sciatica surgery. Thank you for the great time we had yesterday with this Pinewood Derby with the young people. And... Uh, just bless us and keep us. We'll be with those that are still coming. We think of a man named Kendry that we thought he would be here today. But if he's still on his way, give him safety. And all God's people said. Amen. Captain uh, Eddie Rickenbacker was known as a World War I fighting ace. But he also participated in World War II. And on October 21st, 1942, he and seven other crew members ditched their B-24 bomber in the Pacific Ocean. They were so frantic to be able to survive the crash, they forgot their rations, all but four oranges. So they took the rafts that they had, three rafts, and they tied them together. And day after day, they drifted without food and water, and oftentimes delirious, tortured by the sun on the open water, and constantly encircled by the... Uh, triangular dorsal fins of sharks of all kinds. And what followed is one of the most remarkable stories in the history of our country. And Eddie Rickenbacker himself said, if it wasn't, uh, if it weren't for the fact that I had seven witnesses, I wouldn't have dared tell this story because it seems so fantastic, said Rickenbacker. The, the men credited their amazing survival to something in the pocket of Lieutenant Johnny Bartek. It was a pocket-sized khaki-bound New Testament with a zipper arrangement that made it waterproof, remarkably. From the beginning, Bartek, a devoted student of the Lord, led morning and evening devotionals that all the men participated in. And they started in Matthew's Gospel. And one of the men that we t uh, worked with at the jail, um, this was a verse that I meant for him to hear today, but it's one of his favorite verses or passages. Matthew 6 meant a lot to these men when they were on the open water. It says in verse 31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles seek. For either your heavenly Father know knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first, and this is a life verse probably for many of you, right? Matthew 6, 33. Quote this with me, the rest of this. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. 
So that passage became an anchor to these men as they were floating on the, on the sea. And as the men read these verses day by day, they begin to see God provide for them in miraculous ways. And it seems like just when they were near starvation, for God would uh, inexplicably land a bird on Rickenbacker's head, an account says, that there was one that would land there, and he would grab it and use it for food, and then they'd use the rest of it for bait. And this happened time after time. And when they would be at their wit's end because they were uh, thirsty, a cloud would drift overhead and fill the raft with drinking water. They couldn't drink the salt water because that would make them die earlier with this with thirst. And later on, one of the men, Lieutenant James Whitaker, he wrote a best-selling book on this, which I would recommend. It's called We Thought We Heard the Angels Sing. And in it, he described finding faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through those 21 never-to-be-forgotten days. And Whitaker was quoted, and he said this, I don't think there was a man of us who didn't thank God for that little khaki-covered book. It led us to prayer, and prayer led us to safety. And our lesson today for us, and this is what we want to get across today from God's Word, one of the Lord's top desires for us is to lean and rest on Him. One of the Lord's top desires for us is to lean and rest in Him. And these men had no choice but to rest in God and to seek Him first, like it says in Matthew 6.33. That's a primary reason why God instituted the Sabbath, a day of rest. And it started all the way back in the garden, all, all the way back at creation, Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it, he had rested from all his work, remember that, which God created and made. So God rested from his creative work on the seventh day, which would be our Saturday. Did he need the rest? What do you think? Did he need the rest? Of course he did not need the rest. The Lord of the Sabbath instituted the Sabbath in order for men to take his rest, a rest from his works, he wanted man on this day to rest in him. He wanted man in this day to rest in him. And one of my favorite verses is Psalms 46, 10. 10. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. But there's more to it than just a day of rest. A day of rest. The Sabbath was an ultimate picture of the fact that man cannot work his way to heaven. Man cannot work his way to heaven. His sole reliance has to be on Christ because in Acts 4.12 it says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other uh, name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I know Joel Olstein was once interviewed and he said there's many ways to find God. It says, no, there's no other way, under, no other name under heaven given among men. That's Jesus Christ. He said in John 14, 6, it won't be there, but I am, quote it with me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. The Sabbath, as Paul wrote to the church at Colossae in Col Colossians chapter 2, was a shadow of things to come. The, the Sabbath was a shadow of things to come. The Sabbath was a shadow of Christ is the body or the substance of our rest. Christ is the substance of our rest. The Jewish leaders, we will see today in Luke chapter 6, believed in a work-based salvation. They were wrapped up in works. Now, you can show your, your works are an outcropping of your faith, but you're not saved by works, amen? Amen not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us, Titus 3, 5. But the Jewish religious leaders were so wrapped up in legalism and works that they didn't get the fact, like what Paul wrote in Hebrews, they are to cease from their own works. Hebrews 4, there remaineth a rest to the people of God. 
For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. And that was a picture of the rest that we would find in the Lord Jesus Christ. We all, most of us probably know Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of, it is a gift of, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Sabbath was a picture of the rest that we would gain through the Lord Jesus Christ. But by the time Christ, God, came in flesh, Christ was God incarnate, they had so blatantly distorted the original intent of the Sabbath that they drew light years away from what its meaning truly was. And I really believe that the reason that the Lord Jesus often chose to heal on the Sabbath, have you noticed that? The reason I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ often chose to heal on the Sabbath was in order to launch a full-out blown war on their legalism. He hit them at their core. And that infuriated the Jewish orthodoxy, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, these think tanks, the scribes that would be their historians and their knowledge guys of the law. It reaped hot coals upon their head, as Scripture said. But Christ is not interested in rules. He's interested in rest. You empty yourself. You deny yourself. You take up your cross and you follow him. And you have rest in him, just like Eddie Rickenbacker's and his crew on that open water in the Pacific did. His men did just that. But the Jews were interested in anything but rest. They sought after works-based salvation. And let's look at the beginning of Luke 6 and see how Christ would challenge him on that thinking again. In Luke 6, 1 through 2, And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the cornfields and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. Do you know, some of us are a little bit older and we remember the days when you're, you would actually get out of the house and away from, you didn't have computer games, or you would get out and play. And sometimes you come across a field, some of you that lived in the country, and you might take a part uh, in part of something in that field. I remember around our house, this family had a rhubarb patch. Do you ever have rhubarb? Some of you like rhubarb pie. And if occasionally I grab one of those stalks, and, and boy, it was sour, but it was good. So you may relate to being out and rubbing maybe some grain, and, and they would do that. And a wheat grain would be almost like a gummy type of substance. One man, Chuck Smith, the pastor, by the way, that movie, The Jesus Revolution, was based on the pastorate of Chuck Smith out there in California that led the hippie generation movement towards Christ. He talked about how he would eat the wheat uh, grain in the field, and it was like gummy. It was because he said we couldn't afford bubble gum, so that's what we would eat. So these men were out in the field rubbing, these, uh, rubbing this corn in their hands. And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do you that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day? They had so many rules you couldn't even keep up with them. You weren't allowed to bear anything or carry anything. It got so bad that the Jews uh, in, in later years and more modern times, they, they restricted against you having false teeth worn on a Sabbath day because that way you were bearing something, you were carrying something. So they, they were completely consumed by this. In its proper intent, when Israel would keep the Sabbath, it showed pagan people that they relied distinctively on the Lord. Keeping the Sabbath was a way of displaying their trust in God. But the Jews instead began to cherish the Sabbath as a religious ritual. And sometimes we get caught up in those things. The thief on the cross did nothing else before he was told he would be in paradise than call Jesus Lord. Amen? Didn't have time to walk little old ladies across the street. Didn't have time to give to the church. Didn't have time to attend the synagogue. All he said is Lord. All he said was Lord. Remember me when you enter into his kingdom. But the Jews were so consumed. Some of you may have been at churches that are so consumed in legalism and what you wear and how you look and how many church services you attend. I never, you never hear me really pounding my fist over people attending church services because the Lord writes his law upon your heart, amen? And I believe the Lord would lead you if you would seek to, to attend certain services. But they were so caught up in religious ritualism and they had perverted God's day of rest. It was supposed to be a beautiful thing. 
they abused the phrase, you shall not do any work, and made it that you couldn't lift your hand to help someone. Help someone. Help a, a cart that had fallen into a ditch or something like that. They made it more from a blessing into a heavy burden that was onerous. It was become a day of burden instead of blessing. Verse 3 of chapter 6. And Jesus answering them said, Have you not read so much as this what David did when himself was hungered and they which were with him? How he went into the house of God and did take and eat the showbread and gave also to them that were with him, which is not lawful to eat but for the priests. And he said unto them that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. See, the, the priests would set out 12 loaves of freshly baked bread on the table of showbread. The 12 loaves of bread represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And only the priests could, uh, the priests would not eat of that bread. They would eat of the bread that they removed, the bread that was not fresh. But there was a time when King David, well, he was not king yet, was running from Saul, and his men were famished. So they approached the tabernacle. There was no temple then. The temple wasn't built until later on. And he approached the priest, Amhimelech, and this is 1 Samuel 22, and he inquired if they could have provisions. And this was that bread that was set out. And boy, there's a special ingredients to this bread I've read about. Boy, it's making me hungry. Stephanie, one time we got it for Christmas, one of those bread makers, and I would call it a bread not maker because she never used it. But she, <laughs> she'd put stuff in it like, you know, bowls or whatever, but no bread. I, but she's not in here, so she can't. Um, but the priest, Ahimelech, came to understand that the preservation of David's life was more important than the ceremonial regulations about the consecrated bread. But... Here's, here's a question for us today. What are we clinging to that keeps us from our rest in the Lord? Something that we feel we have to do to earn his salvation. You know, Jonathan Coons' family is in North Carolina. I had the privilege to sit in the car with him and pray with him, and he accepted Christ. That was a privilege, a remarkable privilege. But I told him that Sometimes if we fall into sin, we don't feel like we are capable of leading anyone to Christ. But if you fall into sin, you're just as much of a child of God if you're in Christ as you were before you had a bad day. John 1.12 says, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. A lot of times we feel, if, if, if we're having a difficult time, why should I go out and witness? But you know what? Before you had a difficult day, or you fell into some like what Paul said, the sin that does so easily beset you, that shouldn't prohibit you from witnessing because you're just as much a believer and righteous before God as you were the day that you didn't sin or the day that you sinned. But the devil wants us to put caveats on anything. And the Lord says this in Matthew 11, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. When you have a works-based salvation, and I'm not saying, Romans says, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? I think it's chapter 6. God forbid. Why should we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid that you do that. We're not supposed to take it as license. It's liberty, but it doesn't give us license. You see what I'm saying? But the Lord says, you rest in him for your salvation. He says, Come unto me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Boy, your soul, you know when your soul is hurting, amen? We're going to talk about that, God willing, tonight, body, soul, and spirit. We all are triune as God created us in his own image, Genesis 1, When your soul aches, that's you, right? That's you. He says, you'll find rest in your soul. Some of us have unrestful souls. But he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now this about the Sabbath. The, it was a threefold Sabbath, as we see many things in Scripture. The Sabbath went beyond just one day. God then told them not only the rest on the Sabbath day, which would be our Saturday, but he also told them the rest on the Sabbath week and the Sabbath year. 
stay with me on this, they were to rest every seventh day, every seventh week, that's meaning every seven years. To the Jew, a week of years is seven years. And every seventh year, seven years times seven. So every 49 years, they would have this great event spoken of in Leviticus 24, 5, the Jubilee. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. He's the Lord of the Jubilee. He's, he is the Jubilee, Jesus Christ. He's the one that gives us liberty. So they were to rest not only on a day of the week, the seventh day, in Luke, Leviticus 23, 3, six days shall work be done. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of what? Rest. And holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. And that's where the, the Pharisees and the Jews, where they didn't even know what really work was, right? You shall do no work thereof. It is a Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Then you were supposed to rest a Sabbath week which meant week of years. I know it's a little bit hard to understand, but in Scripture, when you see this, in this context, it's a week of years. It's seven years. Look at Leviticus 25. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. When did they come into the land? After they got through the wilderness journey, right? They were in the wilderness journey 40 years. They came into the land. And it was then that the Hebrews became... An agrarian society, in other words, they could sow and reap, right? You can't sow and reap when you're traveling on the road. So how were they fed? Manna and quail, right? God provided for them, amen? They rested in him, Lord Jesus. They rested in him. But when they got into the land, then they became growers, just like my ancestors out there in Virginia. They were growers. And they would have to take a rest from the field work, they were to rest the field every seventh year. In verse 4 of Leviticus 25, In the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow the field nor prune the vineyard. Now, if they obeyed in doing this, if they obeyed in doing this, and that's an if, God would give them, listen to this, a bumper crop on the sixth year. The bumper crop was so magnificent that it would carry over into the ninth year, amen? So if they were hoarders and they didn't believe, and by the way, us not resting in the Lord is unbelief because we think we do it better than they do. And that's why the Jews were in the wilderness for 40 years because it was their unbelief. They should have made it in 12 days. But they lasted 40 years, and that's why we spin our wheels, because we think we could do it ourselves. So he says, if you rest in me, if you believe in me, the sixth year, you're going to have a bumper crop. And could you imagine, could you imagine the faith it took for you to say, I'm not going to plow the land, I'm not going to put the seeds down, everything's, we're just going to sit that land still for that whole seventh year. Could you imagine how difficult that would be? I know some of you, when you worked, you were like clockwork, probably. You ate breakfast at a certain time. You got up at a certain time. Could you imagine your Heavenly Father saying, you know what, you're not getting up today. You're not going anywhere. I'm going to provide for you. You're not going to do any work. You're like, oh, but wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. But that's what they were asked to do. And the Lord would provide for them. They would provide for them. So they were supposed to rest a seventh day and also a seventh year. Verse 20, or verse 8 of Leviticus 25. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years. Oh, so this was day, which was Saturday. Week, which was seven years. They were supposed to rest the land every seven years. And then a Sabbath, a year, which would be seven times seven. So look how it's explained in Leviticus 25.8. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years. Seven times seven years. So 49 years. And the space of seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee 40 and nine years. Then thou shalt cause the trumpet of Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. And in the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout your land. So seven times seven. A Sabbath year. For 49 years, they were allowed to work, but on that 50th year, that would be a jubilee year. All the slaves were released, all the debt released, everything that was relinquished would come back. 
And God was doing this that they would rest. Brittany, in, in her interview this week, I, wasn't that a good picture of her in Malachi? In her interview with me, she quoted, I believe, Isaiah 41. But Isaiah 40, that's one of my favorites. And one of my favorite verses is this in 4031. Can you quote it with me? It's up there. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. How do we renew our strength? By waiting in the Lord, by resting in the Lord like those men did. Legalism steals God's blessings and replaces them with burdens. What things are we putting in our life that are legalistic that we rely more on our rest in God? Are we practicing that in our lives? Now, again, I'm not saying... I'm not saying that we should say, well, I can just run off and do anything I want, any sin that I want, anything the flesh wants, I'll give the flesh. No. How should we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, God forbid that we do that. But the resting in the Lord for our salvation, our salvation, our daily strength. In verse 6 of Luke 6, and it came to pass also on another Sabbath, yet another Sabbath, that he entered into the synagogue. By the way, Jesus was always in the synagogue. Should we follow that pattern? Should we follow that pattern of being? Now listen, it's not legalism. You're not saved by coming to church. But what I think does, what the church does corporately, we can edify one another. Amen? You know how good it was to see Louise today? You know, we could read of Louise and talk about her being, write letters, but when she's here, that's remarkable. A body jointly fitted together, we can encourage one another. Build each other up with the spiritual gifts that you have. There's nothing like being together, Right? There's nothing like being together. I told Roy, a soccer team is a soccer team. When every player, Marcos plays soccer, he can relate to this. Everybody that plays soccer, when they're in their houses getting ready for the game, they're still a soccer team. But when they have power and strength is when they're on the field together, right? When they're together with the Lord, amen? Edifying, building each other up. So he was in the synagogue on a Sabbath, and there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day. Do you ever have people, maybe you've had some work bosses that are watching you, waiting for you to make a mistake. Maybe there's somebody in your life that's just watching and waiting for you to stumble. And that's what they were doing. They did this so they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts. You know, he knows our, th- our, our thoughts, does he not? Read Psalm 139. He knows our uprising and downsitting. He, he knows us because we're fearfully and wonderfully made. He, knows their, he knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up, stand forth in the mist. And he rose and stood forth. And But the Pharisees, these religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, I guess we can kind of look at them like our Congress, right? <laughs> Pharisees and Sadducees, that's what they are. They, their main thrust was to observe rules. The majority of them were not God's rules, they were man-made rules. That was a problem. But Jesus had no rules and regulations like that to be able to heal on the Sabbath. For him, the cry of human needs superseded all things, amen? It superseded all those things, including the Sabbath, because he is Lord of the Sabbath. He's Lord of the Sabbath. The tragedy of this all is that the ones that eventually took his life are the most earnest about religion. Religion. I say it's a relationship, not a religion. It's a relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ. A relationship with him. We walk with him, just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. And then they sinned, and they had to get a covering for themselves. And I believe because they had to get a covering, because I believe before that, the Shekinah glory of the Lord covered them. When we sin, we lose a little shine. We lose a little shine. But thankfully, 1 John 1, 9 says, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. I feel like I'm on a Mr. Microphone. And to cleanse us from all (laughs) righteousness. It's getting worse. You know, um, who was it? I'm going to quote Charles Spurgeon lately. You know, or later. (laughs) He preached in London, England to three or 4,000 people, and they never had one of these. How did they do that? So, their religious ritualism drove him to the cross. Verse 9, then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? And looking around about 
upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other, and they were filled with madness. Could you imagine how steeped you are in works that you're mad when a man's hand gets restored? They were filled with madness and commune one another with one another what they might do to Jesus. There are some places so legalistic that they're more concerned what people wear into church than their own heart. They were filled with madness. Not content with God's word alone, the Jews spent hour after hour trying to figure out what is work. Generation after generation trying to figure this out. The Mishnah is their coded law, and it has so many different things in there. And they spent hour after hour trying to figure out what you could or couldn't do. Do you think Jesus was concerned about that? He was concerned about souls. We are to rest in him. Not our strength, not our works, but to rest in him. Amen? Amen. Secondly, this, and finally this. We're to pray like him. Rest in him and pray like him. And it came to pass, verse 12, that in those days that he went out into the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Remember that verse. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples. And of them he chose, and of them, keep that in mind, he chose twelve whom also he named apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter, Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew. By the way, what did the Philippi jailer tell Paul and Silas when the earthquake hit the prison and they were going to be loosed? Paul and Silas says, don't kill yourself. We're all, going to be, we're all here because he, he would have been capital punished if those men got loosed. And then he says, what sh- must I do to be saved? Acts 16, 30, and 31. And I think it was Paul that said to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And it's salvation starts with you, and it trickles to your family. Jonathan and Trish, that like Roy said, were traveling. They brought a couple here last week. That's where it starts with you, and then it extends off to your family. You can win your family, unlike one of us, because you're there. So he went to the mountain to pray. And continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, I just read that. But he called the disciples, and these were brothers here. Two brothers, sets of brothers. In in verse 15, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon called Zelots, and Judas the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. So here, he selected his apostles. You know, think about this as we're wrapping this up. Oh, boy, when I go to those mountains to see where my granddad lived, would to God there would be a quiet place to pray like that here? Where are your quiet places? Where do you go to pray? You know, with all these... You're right, but where is it quiet? You know, there's... Yeah, that's one place. But with the phones and all the cacophony that comes with that, where do you find solace? Where do you go to find a quiet place to pray? Where can we be alone with him, truly alone? And he retired to the mountain. He retired to the mountain. Oh, would to God that we would pray as seriously as the King of kings and Lord of lords did here? When was the last time we prayed an hour? It said here that he prayed all night. He prayed all night. We're to rest in him. We're to pray like him. This was God in flesh who felt it important to pray. And yet we fail, like the disciples did in the Garden of Gethsemane that night, to tarry with him one hour. When's the last time we prayed for an hour, let alone all night? And the reason he prayed all night, because this was a vital decision. There's many disciples, but only 12 apostles. And here he was making the decision that would affect the course of history And that is the selecting of the 12 apostles. Do we seek the Lord out when it comes time to make a big decision? Do we go to a mountain and pray? Do we have a quiet place? Denise mentioned some, but there's a a place that you only know that could be a true quiet place. 
The phones are such a bombardment on our minds and our society. It's terrible. There's got to be a place for us to go. I love what Charles had in Spurgeon. He was that pastor I talked about earlier. We're getting ready to close. I want to read this quote from Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I thought he put it amazingly. We cannot watch with him one hour, but he watched for us whole nights. Look at John 17 when you go home. It gives you a window into Christ, that beautiful prayer in John 17, when he prays for himself and he prays for the disciples, and the prayer for his disciples is remarkable. And he says, Lord, that you would keep them. Lord, that they're in the world, but let them not be of the world. And that's how we, when we go to the prison ministry or jail ministry, we pray for these men that when they get out of jail, that the Lord would keep them. Because when they get out, they're very vulnerable. They're like the cast sheep we've talked about, right? The sheep that gets turned over and the shepherd has to come over and turn him back because when is he most susceptible to predators than when he is cast? Why is my soul cast down? So he remarkably prayed, we can't watch for an hour. He watched for us whole nights. Continuing, the occasion for this prayer is notable. It was after his enemies had been enraged Prayer was his refuge and solace. Why were they enraged? Because he healed on the Sabbath. It was before he sent forth the 12 apostles. Prayer was the gate of his enterprise. The song says, take it to the Lord in prayer. We often take our troubles to everybody else, and the last one we go to is the Lord. The gate of his enterprise was his prayer. The herald of his new work. He would do a tremendous work through these men. He's prayed all night as he approaches decision. Should we not learn from Jesus to resort to special prayer when we are under a peculiar trial or contemplating fresh endeavors for the master's glory? And he closed with this. Lord Jesus, teach us to pray. And finally this. And finally this. We're to rest in him. Those men on that lifeboat, those lifeboats, they had nowhere else to turn but to the Lord Jesus Christ. And for our salvation, we have nowhere else to turn. If you don't know Christ, if you don't know Christ, accept him. He said that I gave my life as a ransom to all Christ did. He said I came for those that were in need of a physician. We read that last week in Luke chapter 5. He's not willing that any should perish. I, I enjoy me and Bob. My favorite football team is the Minnesota Vikings, sadly. Never won a Super Bowl. Unlike the Steelers, right? Unlike the Browns, right, Stacy? Their coach died. Their longtime coach died. 95 years old, Bud Grant. I don't believe he was a Christian. I don't believe he was a Christian. He lived his life dedicated to many things, but not the Lord. Rest in him. Rest in him. And finally, pray like him. If none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, thought prayer important, how much should it be for us? Amen? Amen. How much should it be for us, that prayer? And often we won't watch for an hour because everything's got to be quick, right? Quick, 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 quick. We need it to be quiet in our lives. Let's be still and know that he is God. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this time you've given us Oh, Father God, thank you for the rest we have in you. Thank you, Lord, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. The generation that came out of Egypt, save Joshua and Caleb, were not able to rest, enter the promised land, into their rest because of unbelief. Lord, let us have belief in the rest you've given us through Jesus Christ, the true rest, the true picture of the substance of the Sabbath was the rest we have in you, Father God. Let us rest in you every day. Let us rest in you, Father, the captain of our salvation. And Lord, also let us pray like you, Lord. I'm embarrassed by my menial prayer time. 
that it's not as substantial as what you showed that night you prayed the whole night. Father, let us pray like you. And thank you, Lord, for teaching us to pray. Be with us, Lord, as we go out. Bless us this evening in our service. And all God's people said. Okay. Brandon, you know what? Two six thirty. I don't know if we go that far in here. <laughs> six thirty. Yeah. I didn't think we had twenty four hundred pages in here. Six thirty. Let's stand as we sing. <laughs> If you don't know Christ, come and accept him. You know, Billy Graham always used to say that anybody that Christ called, he called publicly. You can get saved right at your seat there. But there's something about publicly professing him, amen? We're proud of our grandchildren. We're proud of our kids. We're proud of our, our co-workers. And we tout them and we let people know who they are. If you've accepted Christ in your heart, come Profess him before man. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. If you don't know him, come accept him. We often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is it trouble? And still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise for thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a solace there. Jeff Lundstrom, would you close in prayer, please?